Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 that's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I am Raymond Fletcher. Along in the studio with me is Jennifer Solis. To my right is Kurt Dukach. Perry Haichu. Lawrence on the board. Always make us sound good. And we have a special guest today. This is Shimi Kona from uh, the Testing Labs of Las Vegas. Hi, and thank you for having me. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you are part of the Testing Labs in Las Vegas for cannabis. Correct, correct. It's very exciting and brand new field that's opening up in Nevada. You and I were talking earlier um, off, off the microphone about your previous business and how you got uh, into testing cannabis in Nevada. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. We started about eight years ago in uh, a uh, safer detergent uh, company uh, that's called Green Life Development. We uh, work closely with the EPA the Environmental Protection Agency on uh, creating safer cleaners. Safer meaning green, meaning biodegradable, uh, non-toxic, uh, water-based, uh, just things that do not interfere or hurt the environment. And uh, that is a, uh, uh, a feel that's very dear to us. So uh, in the evolution of things, uh, years goes by and suddenly uh, you can open a testing lab for cannabis. and. Uh, with our involvement with uh, formulation and uh, quality assurance, uh, we just uh, decided to enhance our lab and uh, add uh, more uh, equipment to it and uh, thus testing for cannabis. That's great, that's awesome. I know I met you um, at a mixer at Springs Preserve and when you started explaining about your product development for your, cre the, your, glean your green cleaning products, I thought, oh, this is awesome. You, you can use them uh, in your cultivation, uh, you can use them in your production facility, and you have a testing lab. And so you've, you've kind of got the cleaning and the testing uh, market kind of cornered here. Correct, correct. Yeah, it, 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 there's really a lot of uh, commonalities uh, between the two. And, uh, you know, it's just putting our expertise and, and adding onto it is is so exciting. We're, we're so looking forward to, to opening doors. And uh, if everything goes uh, goes correctly, we'll we'll start testing in the next uh, next month or so. So your your lab is called Test Lab Las Vegas, um, and it's located on Charleston. And one, one of your mottos is have a nice green day. And I guess that ties into your cleaning products. But um, Correct, correct. It, and also the cannabis. Um, it's amazing how things work out, right? Exactly. What, what's required to be tested in Nevada out of the cannabis? Okay, so basically everything that is sold in a dispensary, which is the selling arm of, uh, of the establishments, has to be tested. And by tested in Nevada, they, they mean serious business. I mean, this is, uh, there's eight tests that are required for plant material and growers who, uh, who sell their products or pass them, pass them on to production facilities or uh, dispensaries have to test for eight different things. Moisture, potency, terpenes, foreign matter, microbial, mycotoxin, heavy metals, pesticides. I mean, this is, Nevada is the first, uh, first state to enhance uh, testing on, on uh, medical cannabis. And that is really a breakthrough in, uh, in this among all the other states. And, you know, having, uh, what, half the states right now having uh, medical marijuana legal is saying a lot for Nevada. Well, we've long said that we want to be we want to be the model for the nation. And I think this is an excellent start. Um, so how would you get the products to test who who's going to be handling those products? And if you could tell me a little bit about about the process, I think that um, that our viewers would be really interested in understanding this. Correct. Correct. So uh, the state has put together an agent card uh, program or uh, um, 
uh, I guess, a uh, certification. So you have to be registered, which means uh, a background check, fingerprinting, uh, et cetera. You have to belong to an MME establishment, which means either a grow, production, dispensary, or a lab, um, which means all owners or employees. Everything that is registered in that business has to have that card to handle and actually touch any uh, uh, medical marijuana product. Um, there are uh, some gray areas that we're still uh, trying to figure out. Um, how much can you carry? How big? Um, I mean, how do you have to um, um, package, it? package it? Or do put it do together? you have it have to have like lots of it and they have to be like in one pound or two pound lots to be so, tested? So for, uh, for uh, buds or flower uh, a product, uh, every five pounds has to be tested. So there is an, uh, uh, another regulation about how do you pick out that uh, that sample. It has to be randomly selected. Uh, if the grower selects it, uh, then there's a lot of paperwork involved. If the lab selects it, then uh, there's less paperwork. So lab agents, and this is what we, uh, we're currently trying to uh, employ, our agent to go into the sites and actually select that product. And we will, and we have a, uh, a selection uh, uh, procedure outlined for that purpose. How large of a sample is usually required to make your guys' uh, tests accurate? It's, it's relatively small, but, uh, you know, uh, so for, uh, for a grow, it's 12 grams. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, it's... it's, it's <clears throat> out of the five pounds, it's 12 grams? That's, Correct. That's minimal, because, you know, my thought process is, like, if an individual grower, let's say, because there's a stipulation in Nevada law that allows individual growers to sell to dispensaries, so there's been a couple of questions as to whether that specific burden would fall on the uh, person who is purchasing the cannabis, the dispensary, or the purchase who is attempting to sell the cannabis as the individual Correct. grower. Correct. So, you know, would I be able as, a, as an individual patient to come to your lab and test that before I took it the, to the dispensary? So th that's a very interesting question. And it seems like there, uh, the state does not, uh, does not stop that. In Colorado, for instance, uh, individual growers cannot go to the lab. Only a state licensed grower can go into a lab. Here, uh, they, did not, uh, they did not prohibit that. So it seems like it is allowed. I mean, okay. it's, it's still a little gray. We sent, uh, we sent along those questions. Uh, to uh, to the committee who's handling that, and we're awaiting clarification. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. With the eight things that you have to test for, what do you estimate the turnaround time would be on that? So the turnaround time right now uh, stands between uh, two days to a week, and that is uh, related on, uh, of course, on the product uh, that you receive and. Uh, on the testing, uh, certain certain uh, equipment uh, does it faster, certain equipment does it uh, slower. I think once we start uh, uh, testing and uh, having a, um, a knowledge base of what is going on in this state, because every state is different, every strain is a little different, we will know much more. Well, that's really great. Um, one of the things that you guys are testing for is terpenes, and, and uh, that's really awesome news for me. So ter uh, terpenes, uh, as you guys know, are the smell, the taste, the flavor of, of the cannabis, and, and there, are, there, are several, um, there are several different terpenes, you know, hundreds of terpenes for sure. Um, so what about some uh, future testing? Or do you guys have any plans for the future for testing uh, different, different more things? So, so yeah, 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 of course, of course. So we are, uh, we are starting a research team uh, in our lab. Uh, as you guys know, the testing equipment is, is very expensive and uh, it's just hundreds of thousands of, of dollars that are involved here. And uh, we wanna employ this, this just wealth of uh, equipment into the betterment of, of all of us. And uh, having a research team uh, work with us closely, uh, whether it's from uh, the medical schools that are around or uh, from individual researchers that are coming to town. We still have to work all the regulations about, about handling and agent cards. But once we go through this, uh, research is a big part. And once we know more about medical marijuana, we will know uh, what specific strains work on what? There is just just relationship that is known right now. I mean, there's there's a lot of research that has not uh, made it into the medical field because of of uh, the constraints of the federal government. And as we start getting more and more research out there, this will just become more apparent how important this this plant is. Colorado, as you know, just uh, just uh, gave a, about eight million into uh, research. Yes, yeah, we were just talking about it a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, that is that is big news there. for us. 
as we will start to see, uh, uh, you know, state grants, private grants, organizations just, you know, just uh, uh, f flocking into, into this field, n wanting to know what can be done. How can this help? Well, I was going to say, we do have a 170A for medical research for our nonprofit, um, and it's from the federal government. And so maybe we can maybe we can team up or work with you guys somehow. We, uh, correct. Uh, we would love to. Our chief uh, uh, scientific officer, uh, Michael Klipper, uh, is... Uh, he is uh, the chairman of the board of directors of Voices Against Brain Cancer, which is a oh, 501c wow. uh, uh, charity. And uh, he's a member of the granting committee uh, where he works uh, uh, to um, pursue, put together and, and oversee uh, giving millions of dollars uh, into uh, medical research, and especially uh, brain cancer. Is that a group that's here with, uh, with the Brain Institute? Th this is an East Coast group. Oh. Okay. But they but they operate uh, all over the country sure. in in medical research uh, facilities. So uh, one of the big things uh, that that we're planning to do right now is to bring them bring them in town and to bring you know this this these funds that are available for research here to town. And you know besides creating jobs, there's creating a database of. Uh, of the cannabis. Well, let's move back to something that we touched on earlier. You said that you were hiring people to go into uh, the dispensaries or the facilities to select the product, the, the 12 grams of product. Um, what background are you looking for to hire when you're hiring uh, when you're hiring employees for that? That's that's very interesting, and uh, we have been talking to uh, various bodies of how do you get somebody in a brand new field that has so many federal constraints, right? How do you how do you decide what is good and what is bad in, in a person's uh, I guess uh, you know history? Well. First of all, of course, you've got background checks and, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the state requires as far as uh, 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 documentation, F documentation, sure. uh, federal reports, police reports. I mean, these are these are all given. But so I, thugs need not apply. Please, please. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it's uh, I think what we would look uh, to do is uh, to reach out to our veterans community and thanks to, uh, you know, the the. the uh, just a lot of veterans live in Las Vegas uh, because of the Air Force here, and I'm a veteran myself. Uh, just reach out, and uh, a lot of these guys just are looking for jobs, and we would work with them to uh, to uh, give them a place of employment. So, are Sounds you great. looking for me? Yeah, it does sound great. Are you looking for um, are you looking for um, medical marijuana card holders also, or or would you exempt them, or or or, or would they? you know, have a place in your company? So that's that's a very interesting point. So uh, the um, Nevada has actually has it in there, and I'm trying to look for the paperwork for it. Sure. Um, so they have it in their code somewhere? Correct. In the Constitution of the state of Nevada, there's something that's called in uh, professional language, right to bear card. Okay. <laughs> Which in, uh, is uh, anybody in the state can get a medical card and this is this was written uh years ago yeah 2001 correct and uh you know one of them uh, one of the conditions so they uh, outline all the condition and as long as you have a doctor prescribing a card to you there's no reason why you cannot work with that card great that, and that's in our constitution you know that's awesome that's one of the things i've advocated for uh, the past year is uh, patients just because you happen to be a medical marijuana patient shouldn't exclude you from this field or any field provided you know you're not a risk to anybody correct 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 and you know it's all everything is pursuant to law and the conditions are approved so there there, there is some gray area uh, which is kind of hard to discuss at this point but uh, it, it will be cleared in the next coming months yeah well, I'd like to suggest that maybe the people that are card holders that are growers would know what to look for in a sample to select it. So if they're looking at the sample and they happen to see maybe like maybe mold or, or something that they that they select part of that as their sample because they're experienced in knowing what the plants look like themselves versus somebody that is inexperienced with even handling the product. Correct, correct. And, you know, the first thing is you know, uh, eye visibility. What is visible that doesn't seem to be normal? And I think a lot of them actually do that. Uh, uh, the, the, the current growers or the card holders uh, that are growing privately are very particular in what they grow. And, uh, you know, they're considered uh, connoisseurs mm -hmm. in, in this field. Connoisseurs. You know. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, 
So just like wine and cheeses, there are those those growers that are very picky in what they in what they grow. And uh, the minute there's something that uh, looks fishy or uh, out of the ordinary, they just cut it out and, and destroy it. Yeah, I, I just recently had to pull a couple plants out of my room, and uh, I got got a little heat from it, and uh, I I just had to remind her, you know, why why cry over spilt milk when you have a cow? Be- better be <laughs> safe than sorry. That's what we yeah, always say. Exactly. Safe than sorry. Is Sometimes the problems just aren't worth putting into the rest of your room. Correct, All correct. Right. And, and as this becomes uh, visible, there's a lot of... I just came back from the CES show, uh, oh. uh, which is a consumer electronics yes. show here, and uh, all you see is all, all sorts of wearable tech. Everything is uh, supposed to be portable, put on your cell phone, put on your pocket, on your uh, wrist, on your neck, and we see a lot of this happening in our field as well as far as testing. And I, I think growers will have a lot of technology available to them to have initial testing out in the field out sure. in the in their grow homes so which is uh, as well for for home users well is testing available for home users and would you require such a big sample for home users because yes. at 12 grams we're we i guess we're allowed to uh transport two and a half ounces every two weeks but take 12 grams out of that and and to send that to get tested would be a bit uh, a bit much for a home grower. Do you test um, home grows currently, and is there different prices for people that just want to test their own stuff? Maybe so we do not test uh, home growns yet. We are okay. not open. Okay. So they're still uh, they're still putting the advisory boards uh, together for sure. uh, for the state. So uh, we we haven't we haven't done that. Uh, what's uh, what is going to happen is uh, is basically the less you can pick from a grower the better it would be for a grower and there are tests that can be built upon each other and i think this technology is coming right now Um, we are purchasing brand new equipment and uh, this equipment is very very sensitive Uh, we, we can we can detect things that are you know double triple uh quadruple the amount that is uh that is stated in the regulation so as we start uh, uh, getting closer, we will we will limit this this number well, to a smaller. Um, you kind of touched on it very briefly. You said the state is putting together an advisory board concerning the testing facilities, but um, these dispensaries are very very anxious to get open, and they can't open until you you get open, and they can you can take their medicine. Correct. So. Do we have any idea of when these boards are going to get put together, when they're going to get looked at? Because there's a lot of people who are really, really, uh, of course, as you all know, very anxious, anxious mm-hmm. to get you open. And are you anticipating being the first lab open? or um, I'm anticipated to be in the first wave Fair enough. of, of okay. labs uh, that will open. Uh, but we don't know We don't know enough about each other. Some some names are actually not known to the public right. as, as far as labs. So uh, and, and, of course, dispensaries and growers, a lot of them are unknown. Um, what what is what we do know is that this week um, the state is accepting applications for uh, the laboratory advisory board, and just like any other third party, it needs to be looked upon okay. and scrutinized. And this is what the state is trying to do. So once they put this board together, they still need to put a few other uh, um, regulations to uh, to clarity. So we will wait for that. And there's nothing much we can do just, you know, besides uh, bugging them, calling them, letting them know where we are at and how we can help. All we can do is... Fantastic. We just want to thank you. We're coming up on our first break. Then we have our 420 moment. We got some local news. Are you going to stay with us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Please stay tuned. We'll be back momentarily. Thanks. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. 
You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan 702.org. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. <laughs> Welcome back. That sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment where we honor somebody in the in the cannabis movement. Today's uh, 420 honoree is Sarah Silverman. Sarah Silverman was born December 1st, 1970, and she's an American uh, stand-up comedy and writer and producer and actress. Um, while she's not very overt with her cannabis use, she did bring a vape pin to uh, to one of her gigs, and this is kind of why we're honoring her. She's a writer and an occasional performer on Saturday Night Live and, w- and produced the Sarah Silverman program, which ran from 2007 to 2010 on Comedy Central. She released an autobiography called The Bedwetter in 2010 because she wet her bed until she was in her teens um, because of different medical conditions like um, uh, depression um, and she had an addiction to Xanax. She has a a bipolar disorder. Uh, She credited cannabis with helping her with her uh, medical issues and she also um, she also is a cannabis advocate yeah rolling stone recently appointed seth rogan the stoner king of hollywood but with all due respect to mr rogan as long as snoop dogg continues chiefing 81 blunts a day that title belongs to him had rolling stone named a stoner queen of hollywood her highness undoubtedly would have been sarah silverman well silverman may not even smoke one blunt a day and, and isn't a stoner in traditional sense no celebrity so boldly and overtly supported cannabis in t- 2014 like silverman did with the vaporizer pen gig and I believe that was a red carpet she actually vaped on. She yeah, vaped on the red carpet? On the red carpet of the Emmys. Yes. And she stated that this is my pot. It's liquid pot vapor. <laughs> so she, nice. she she didn't just pull out a pen. She told everyone what was well, in Exactly it. what it was. Oh, so why she may be not downing blunts, uh, she's doing it more subtly and with some class which is kind of unusual for her. Well, uh, the only way you can get away with it on the red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> it's classy. Unless Stay you're classy. Dog. <laughs> right. So, All right. So we salute you, we Sarah salute Silverman. We salute you, Sarah. All right, you guys. Well, coming back in, um, Michelle Fiore. On again, off again, on again, off again. Is um, she on again this week? Uh, well, you know what? She wrote a letter to Assembly Speaker John Hambrick on Friday questioning his authority to remove her as a majority leader in the lower house. Yeah, he, she basically called him out and said, if you're going to throw me out, I'm not going to go quietly. You're going to have to call a vote and then have them vote me out. So you know, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. But that, that, that's a politically smart move, though, because you don't want one individual having the power to say, you could do this, but you can't. I mean, and if she was a man... If she was a man, half this crap would not even be happening. Honest to God. That's why she's putting her foot down. She's not standing for it. And, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I have a hard time believing they're going to vote her out right away, though. Well, it just seems like there's so much trouble being stirred even before any bills get brought up. It's just really, it, it, it is what it is. And, you know, uh, I heard a little blurb from John Ralston, who recently got a new gig with the Reno Gazette. He's like, oh, I'm so happy to have gotten a columnist job right before the greatest legislative session ever. So... We'll see. Well, you know what? The, Michelle's saying that only the members of the Assembly Republican Caucus can vote her out of Nevada leadership job, and I actually happen to agree with her. Uh, she called a meeting of the 25-member GOP caucus for Monday afternoon in Carson City to hold another election. So that was yesterday. What's up with that? 
No updates. I didn't no get an update with that yet. No updates either. Okay, and she also stated there's no standing rule for assembly standing rules that allow you to arbitrarily remove me from an elected caucus position that she wrote in her letter. Um, I happen to agree with her. So as we get updates, we'll talk about this. The reason this is so important, and she's on the Department of Taxation, is because our new um, our new legislature. Um, are going to be voting and passing through bills for complete legalization, and it has to pass through, uh, you know, tax committee. That's right, because there's a two-thirds clause in our law, because if there's any new taxing or any taxation at all that's applied to this uh, new bill, it has to have a two-thirds majority vote in order to be voted in, which is why we had such trouble passing our original dispensary bill, Senate Bill 374, last session. So, of course, with this recreational bill, they'll be you know, taxes applied, there'll be uh, expenses, you know, a new, probably a new branch of government will be created to regulate it and things like that, which is where that taxation gets triggered. So that's where her committee comes into play because of course it has to go through her. And as the chair of that committee, you know, the bill can either go forward or die with her say so. So it's definitely like we've stated before on the program, you know, it's a good thing to have people who have shown their support for us uh, in powerful places. For sure. Speaking of people uh, that show support in powerful places, uh, Tick proposed, Tick Siegerbloom, Senator Siegerbloom, for for those of you that are first-time listeners, uh, proposed uh, a BDR 657 on December 31st, 2014. Now, for those of you that aren't in the know, this BDR it calls for a one-time increase by 50% in the total number of dispensaries that may be issued in each county. In counties where only one dispensary is currently allowed, the counties whose population is less than 55,000, there should be a one-time increase in additional dispensaries to kind of clear up this little mess that we got going here. Um, the other thing that I find that's very important about this BDR is that there's no new application fees on either the state level or the local governmental jurisdiction. So if you've already applied and you didn't get it, you still got a foot in the door. The other thing that's really important, I think, on this one um, is that each local government jurisdiction may select any dispensary applicant that has been approved by the state without regard to the state's rankings. So it doesn't matter where you ranked as long as you got the nod. Yeah, it seems like he, he put this bill draft together to deal with the, the county eight and the state eight, but it also opens the doors for North Las Vegas, city of Las Vegas and Henderson to add additional applicants that have already applied and say, hey, you know, like North Las Vegas was complaining when they took the six away from them and only gave them four. Well, right. now they so have a now, chance to add two more. So now I was just going to say, does that 50% apply to the original number that was granted in the state law or does that new number apply to the new, you know, it, the it, new number? It goes by the original in the law, but if the county had 18, they can add nine more, which allows them to add the, you know, the, 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 the county eight that they, that didn't get it. I know, but you know, you understand what I'm saying though, right? Just because the county has decided to take these extra dispensaries from these other municipalities, does that now stop those other municipalities from attempting to get what they perceive as their correct, yeah, their correct 50% from the original amount that should have been granted them in the first place. Well, the additional dispensaries are going to be distributed, um, to each local governmental jurisdiction within the county in proportion to their population population, not yeah. their card oh. use like it was before. Remember, it was like whoever has the most cards. Is that why the county is that? I thought the county was on purely population basis. They were making that argument. I didn't know they were no. making the argument on there yes. was a disproportionate amount of patients in their jurisdiction. That's what they were making okay. the argument for. The county was saying that that they had the most uh, patients in the county. Therefore, that they, yeah, but they there were, are new patient numbers now. There have been so many new patients. And I got a story on that one. Really? Well, can you di- do. dive into that real quick? Yeah. OK. Great news for medical marijuana companies hoping to open their doors this year. The customer base is rapidly growing. The number of registered medical cannabis patients in the state jumped more than 50% from 4,989 to 7,491. Woohoo! This is according to the latest data from the Nevada Department of Health. The patient base jumped roughly 15% since October, highlighting increased interest from locals registering for MMJ cards as the state's dispensary programs advances. At current patient levels, Nevada medical marijuana cannabis market could generate nearly 15 million in annual sales, according to estimates by Marijuana Business Daily. 
Wow. You know what? I was in my uh, doctor's office the other night getting my renewal, and there were 10 people in there with me. Yeah, and so I said, Kurt, hour. quit. Give me some cards. <laughs> quit. Give me some cards. Start passing them out. We got a big discussion. It was almost like a patient meeting. Yeah. yeah. I think from now on, if I'm having a slow day, I might just go sit in the doctor's office and bring in new people. <laughs> well, Las Vegas alone had uh, nearly 35 million visitors this year through the end of October. So imagine if just we, 1%. We cracked, we cracked 40 million. I read recently yeah. okay. that we cracked over 40 million. So, so imagine if just 1% of those visitors had medical marijuana cards. And we are rough for oh, yeah. We Here. were using that math during last legislative session to try to argue that exact point, exactly what you just put out there. If 1% of the population in any given state has cards, they come to visit, etc. We used all that math, man. It was It, it worked perfectly before. And... Uh, yeah, people were it's asking us for people were asking for us for our projections. I had lobbyists ask me for our projections that we went up there two years ago with, and they were like, "Can we take a look at those?" Because we we did a, a, a real projection, and the real projection that we presented up in legislature, we were told, "Don't do that. This is going to scare Scale everybody. Scale this back." So we scaled it back by a third, and those were numbers were more presentable. I still have those numbers. Uh, uh, well, so if you guys want to peruse them. But going back to the original story, sure. <clears throat> um, now I'd like to know, out of this new glut of patients, where are they? Are they in North Las Vegas? Are they in the city? Are they in the county? Et cetera, so on and so forth. And are those numbers going to be available to the local regulatory bodies? Does the city council of Las Vegas want those hard numbers from the state health or the behavioral and human services department of the state? Will the city council of North Las Vegas want those numbers to make their case for why they should get more dispensaries with this new bill draft six? What is it? Oh, oh, it's uh, BDR 657. So that'll probably be the new rally cry this year, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was able to get the number breakdown for which community had which patients and whatnot, the number of patients. I'll get that for the next show. Right on. Thank you. I mean, we saw what happened here uh, over New Year's. There were a slew of, uh, of, of tourists. Imagine what's going to happen next New Year's, next Christmas. Imagine 420. And they, they had a, a hempy That's New right. Year uh, function. Uh, downtown for on New Year's Eve, and there were there were quite a number of people there. There were a lot of people. The police have ended up showing up eventually, with ran, <laughs> which ran off a good amount of the crowd. So we decided to leave with the rush of traffic that left at that time. I didn't but, even yeah. see the police. Maybe I oh, was. they were. They had. Well, they. <laughs> That's a good place to be, Ray. They weren't Raymond. so crazy aggressive about it. Like they had a couple of guys with suits on that had uh, the badges showing out of the suit pocket. They were kind of like you know wagging their finger at people. And uh, then eventually uh, a Mark Cruiser showed up, and that's when things got real quiet. Well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> were they wagging their finger at people that were smoking out in the in the? No, facility, they weren't. Or? They weren't. They weren't too bad about it, from what I saw. I don't think. I think things got a little funny when they fired up like the, this giant one ounce joint. They were trying to smoke <laughs> in public, and they were just like, "Hey, now, you know, back it up, you know, back it down." Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think they showed up because of the because of the smoking or or the event itself. I, from what I heard, they came because of uh, the venue uh, with permitting issues. So. Oh, okay. Well, well, from my understanding, uh, one of the performers uh, might have had a number of underage people in their entourage, is what I was hearing. So there seems rumors, to be, rumors. you know, rumors, what, what, rumors. whatever happened, whatever happened, it was a wonderful event. It was and, still fun. For sure. And that that cocoa was awesome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I look forward to having uh, other events like that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, guys. I'm glad you guys had a great time on that one. Um, I don't know if we're going to dial it back to. Speaking of, who who played on at that event and. and you guys know any of the bands or anything that played, um, or are you just too baked? <laughs> I was just going to say, don't ask me specifics like that. I can tell you where it was and things like that, but I could I can't recall any of the specific performers. But I do not recall. <laughs> no. There was some music play. That's all I recollect. He didn't go there for the bands, <laughs> right? Right. I went for the medical thing. Man, were they good? Oh man, were they good? Right on, right on. So I'm I'm really happy. The more events are starting to happen like this in town, um, so you guys should get out and join us on uh, Meetup.com forward slash Weekend Seven O Two to hear about some of these events and possibly join in the fun. Like our monthly meeting that we are having on Saturday. For from 2 to 4 at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf on Maryland Parkway, south of Harmon, right across from UNLV. That's our patients meeting. If you would like to find out more about how to get your cannabis
cannabis card or uses of cannabis, or you just want to check out uh, and come and out meet the community. Come out and meet the community. By all means, come out and join us from two to four at uh, Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf across from UNLV. We also have something coming up on um, the twenty fifth. The twenty fifth. I was also thinking Friday. This Friday the 17th will be at the, the LVCIC and CCIC Mixer. That's a lot of Cs. Yeah, and uh, and that one also, um, Pony Boy is going to be playing there from Las Marijuana. Awesome. Yes, and I believe Hydro is going to be there also. No, no, I'm talking about this Friday. Isn't the Medical Marijuana Association going to yeah. discuss on how to, how to fix this problem? Yes, the Las Vegas Medical Marijuana Association is holding their monthly meeting at the Lowry's Prime Rib on Flamingo at 11 p.m., and it's $40 to get in, and it's a roundtable discussion on BDR 657. Um so uh, it's just talking, people talking about how they're going to fix this and you're talking about the bill draft that tick is going to Most people appreciate their, their events. They're usually really classy and, you know, Lowry's is a nice place. I would definitely recommend going there if you have the opportunity and just networking. networking so where is that? Uh, who is the association again? The Medical Marijuana Association? Las Vegas Medical Marijuana Association. So you guys can look them up, Las Vegas Medical Marijuana Association. So speaking of uh, problems, there has been a tug of war. There's been a showdown. There's the, the county eight and the state eight. And oh my God. Yeah, Raymond, talk about it. <clears throat> He's rolling his eyes right now, folks. Oh. I'm, I'm gathering myself. <laughs> and it's not because he hit his pen. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> well, they're trying to clear this up with this new bill draft, but... Uh, but you know, do we have any idea when that bill draft would even take effect? Like it could be six it months be before that even gets it, going. It, well, he's planning on trying to get that into a bill and vote it at right away so that they can take action on it and get it into a, get it into effect this year. And basically, it's you know, to it's not they're not going to be taking any more applications. They're just going to add applications to is what he wants to. He wants to eliminate this lawsuits between the state and the county and you know who got this license and who didn't get this license and just let them all have their licenses and you know and kind of just put that whole mess behind us is what he's so trying raymond to do. back to the fight you're gathering yourself have you gathered let's just say my good friend steve is now on my target list if i see uh clark county commissioner uh steve so slack i wouldn't mind running him over but that being said the county did play a power play as we discussed before and they in my in my opinion illegally confiscated dispensaries from other communities they did that early on yeah yes they did that and that's how they went from 10 to 18. well because of whatever they did thinking that they're better than the state and i'm sorry the state is the state yeah the they're gonna trump county. you so they lost those eight they they played poker and they lost <laughs> basically good analogy good analogy so basically the the uh, Nevada judge ruled that the process that the process the state officials used to select businesses to was fair was fair as if relations between the local the local municipalities weren't strained already enough now you have them literally stepping all over each other's backs to steal from each other and they can't even get that right well I remember <laughs> when that first happened we had Isaac Barone on the show um, and he is one of the council members from North Las district, Vegas district one district one and and he was just concerned Concerned about you know hey if we're all friends here why didn't we get together and discuss this why did you guys just kind of announce this on uh, on your own you want to know why I'll tell you why because they're greedy campaign money it just seems like a deal could have been cut yeah you know, I understand that there are debts that have been incurred between the local municipalities you know the county might owe this you know, municipality money or North Las Vegas might owe the county money because of public works projects or this that and the other it seems as though they could have very easily bargained that away like hey you know we have these dispensary licenses that we know you want can we come to some kind of deal about this why did you have to just like force the issue well you and know? that it was kind of dirty pool at the time because North Las Vegas was just coming out of they were almost going to file bankruptcy right. I remember and like the week before this and then the week after after that then they were you know uh, voting to incorporate MME operations in uh, in their municipality and they were dealing with this this uh, you know this almost bankruptcy this financial uh, you know this financial hardship yeah. that they were having and then this just kind of got snatched from well, them. and no doubt that kind of played into our hands attempting to woo these local governments because you know we still you know the economy wasn't uh, quite rocking along as it is now you know a couple of years ago when we were making these arguments and 
it was very easy for us to say, look, you know, you need the money. It's very easy for you to jump on board with this. It's a, it's a tax you can get behind. And, you know, it really did play into our hands at that time. And, you know, it is what it is. And luckily we were able to, to get that through when we did. So I, I'm not sure whether that, that uh, argument would have made sense now with the way things are going. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And I've spoke to several, uh, several of the dispensary winners, several um, MME um, awardees about the tug of war between the state and Clark County. Um, also, news shows have been going after them. I've been going after them to get some people on our show, and uh, several of them are saying they don't want to go on record with an opinion either way. They're just laying low. <laughs> Same thing I, I've, I've, I've heard. They're laying low, and they're like, no, I don't want to come on board and talk about that. They don't want to go on record. They don't want to go on, on record. And, and you can't blame them because well, they, they really? may jeopardize their business. Well, yeah, who wants to stick their neck out like that? And for what? What's the, what's the reward for that risk? Yeah, it's exactly. called being a leader, and I don't care. This is an industry where you're supposed to help people. You either have the gravitas to do so, or uh, sit down and shut up. Fair enough. <laughs> so, have any of you guys got any more local news? Or there's anything from Mesquite or anything? I like got that? something from Mesquite, but I got a, I got something right before it too. Okay, what's up? Uh, we got a uh, former uh, U.S. Democratic Senator Mike Gravel, who represented Alaska in the 70s. He's going to come out here to Nevada and uh, head a company that develops and markets cannabis throat lozenges and other products in states that have taken steps to legalize cannabis. He's 84, and he will run Kush, a subsidiary of publicly traded Cannabis Sativa Inc., where... He previously served nine months on the board of director. So that raises a question to me that we got to test someone from testing here on the edibles. How, how are you testing those? Are you testing them for the same things or strengths or what exactly? Yes, she means, what's, on that? What's Do you test that? them before they come edibles? Do they have to be edibles to test them? So, so it seems like everything that comes out of the grow has to be tested. And then again, when, once it gets processed, because the batch size of a grow versus a batch size of cookies is very different. Potency sure. is very different. Mm -hmm. Once you uh, heat up uh, uh, the, the, the chemical ingredients in, in marijuana, in, in the cannabis plant, they just change composition. Sure. Carboxylation. THCA I, I becomes THC cool. alone. I would assume the same things apply for the newly uh, blowing up hash and wax. Correct, correct. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, word of the year was vape, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty amazing. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of edibles and, and uh, uh Edibles are really the fastest growing segment in, in this industry and uh, not only edibles, I, I guess non-smokables as yep. far as uh, inhalers and uh, oil usage. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, topicals, top topicals coming yeah. into market. So you really don't know who is doing what and, and how. Well, well, I was uh, talking to some clients of mine, and, and they were asking me about, oh, no, we want a dispenser, we want a dispenser. I said, you know what? I think the real money here is going to be in the cultivation and production tied together. If you can get both of those, then I think that, that you'll be just as happy as if you get a dispensary alone. But if you get all three, hey, we'll be happy. That's, that's know, very interesting. Sure. I, you know, I think we followed what Mark Twain said in the gold rush, you know, uh, getting to the pick and shovels. You know, definitely. Yeah, definitely. No okay, we're going to go ahead and take our last break, then we'll come back with some news out of Mesquite and a few other stories. Please stay tuned. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. 
You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, uh, in the studio, we got Jen Solis, Raymond Fletcher, me, Kurt Dukach, Perry Haichu, and Simi. Shimi Kona. Shimi Kona. And of course, Lawrence on the board is making us sound great every week. Oh, we got Rick now on the cameras. Uh, and Rick on the cameras. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. All uh, right, so you got any stories? Waiting oh, la- last thing from Nevada. Newly anointed, appointed, whatever the heck you want to call him. Elected, uh, maybe? He wasn't elected. Oh, he was appointed. Wait, wait, wait. was he elected? Who? Was he U.S. Chris and Hardy? Yeah, he was yes, elected. He beat Horsford. Oh. Oh, yeah. It was a, yeah. Oh, yeah, him. Now I know who it is. <laughs> okay, anyways, he had a, a town hall hearing. Um, out in Mesquite. Out in Mesquite on December 31st on New Year's Eve, for whatever reason. At 9 a.m. Yep. The meeting was the last several town hall sessions Hardy held throughout the district. Um, he said, Mesquite is my home. You will see a lot of me around here. The meeting was well attended with over 40 residents in city council chamber. I'm sorry. 40 residents is not well attended. Well, yeah, for Mesquite. Oh, Hold okay. on. For Mesquite? Yes. For New Year's Eve at 9 in the morning during the week? That's a decent turnout, I would say. Okay. Anyways, Hardy took question for almost two hours, but emphasized that he wanted to, quote, Here's solutions as well as comments. My goal will be try to improve the economy both here and in the nation. Other issues raised include federal protection for Gold Butte. Gold Butte, yeah, mm-hmm. actually, Gold mm-hmm. Butte is a, a hotly disputed uh, public land now. Ah, I thought they got that on, didn't they? I thought they, they got that federal protection. Well, they did get the federal protection. That was where you know the turtles and mm-hmm. it was like the the desert tortoise habitat was and all of that well people are freaking out because it's a fe- they're like oh it's a federal land grab you know it's a more federal land grab more federal land from our state land and things like that but it's just like they're just trying to protect it you know they're just re- worried about restricting like atv access and things like that but yeah anyway sorry sorry ray that's that's cool uh but there were no medical marijuana questions asked which is interesting that is i, I think it's that too early for stoners a- <laughs> oh, well, possibly, but you know, what about the what about the early risers? You know, the I don't want to say the uh, senior citizens, but the folks who were kind of like coming out against it. It's, I, I'm just happy that there was no voices against it. Like, regardless of whether it might have been too early for stutters to show up to voice their their support for it, you know, if nobody if nobody wanted to speak up against it to them, I'm I'm fine with that. You know, no no opposition is is just dandy. So if you're that's, happy, that's a I'm win. Happy. That's a win for sure. Hey, the Wake and Bakers were a little busy at that time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you guys, any got anything else for us? I got something else that, that All right, really Roman. piqued my attention here. All right, let's hear it. Uh, this is out of Columbia, Missouri. A city councilwoman faces recall over anti medical anti marijuana vote. Yay! An elected of, uh, a local official in Columbia is facing a voter backlash after helping to defeat a proposal to decriminalize growing two marijuana plants. On Tuesday, the um, two. 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 That's all it was. It's two. Oi. Uh, and this this is day. This is from Marijuana News on January second. So on Tuesday, the city clerk certified that marijuana reform activists turned in more than enough signatures to force a recall vote on city councilwoman Jenny Chadwick. Chadwick vote them out. Right, Chadwick, who was elected to the council in April of 2014, had initially pledged support decriminalizing cultivation during her campaign. After promising to support the specific ordinance, she won my support and I rec- recommended to other activists in the area that they should support her campaign. Epin, Apin Thampi, a Columbia voter who works with Mid-Missouri Normal, stated. However, when the proposal came up uh, this past October, it was defeated 4-3 to three with Chadwick casting the deciding vote. Oh, that's dirty. Either her ward in the city covers much of the University of Missouri. Oh, mistake. She said she said she thought the policy would confuse students. 
who could still be charged with felonies under state <laughs> law if they were caught cultivating marijuana. I'm protecting okay, no, the I, children. Uh, I've heard this this from uh, the people here, the regents here in Nevada, talking about why medical marijuana cardholders can't grow in their dorm rooms and things like that. They're like, well, it's going to jeopardize our federal funding because the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, receives federal funding from all this. So if we allow you to smoke weed on our campus or if we give you the ceremonious nod of approval, we're, we are jeopardizing all those federal funds. And that's how they, they justified nixing that uh, when it came up for a vote. So I would assume she's pulling the same stuff. But still, like you said, she, you know, she, she rolled the dice on it and... You know, Please uh, continue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. not, not only did she betray her campaign promise to constituents, but she managed to insult us as well by implying that we are stupid and more fit for jail than a classroom, said Zampi, who also serves as an advisor to the University of Missouri Students for Sus Sensible Drug Policy chapter. It's worth noting that the other votes against the ordinance came from council members who were much more respectful of our arguments and who showed at least the willingness to take us seriously, even if they weren't ready to vote in our favor. So basically she said, hey, I'm going to support you guys, then turned around and then voted against they it. burned them. Right. But at least the people that were against it actually gave the people an opportunity to present their argument, the respect. Yeah. I just like that grassroots work. You know, they took the time. They went out there and got the votes, knocked on the doors, and did what it took to really get that recall going. And, you know, it takes a lot of money, and it takes a lot of effort. So, you know, kudos to them for, for putting the work in. People of Columbia, Missouri, I congratulate you and wish you well and hope you have a better representative serving your needs. On that note, I have a story out of Colorado where Colorado is seeking permission for state colleges to grow marijuana on the other side of that coin. Woohoo! Uh, out of Denver, Colorado is making an unusual plea to federal authorities to please let our colleges grow pot. In a letter sent last month, the state attorney general's office is seeking federal health and education officials for permission to uh, for Colorado colleges and universities to, quote, obtain marijuana from non-federal government sources, end quote, for research purposes, because right now, you know, uh, federal law says that you can only get your, your cannabis from one place if it's approved, and that's that University of Mississippi farm. Sure. So they figure that, you know, we do it much better than you guys do, as how most states feel about federal government. So uh, it's like Reagan said, you know, the scariest sentence in the English language is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So they really feel like they don't really need their help. Uh, they can do it themselves better and they've proven it. They want to grow their own medicine. They want to use their own medicine in their own research facilities and not have to deal with that University of Mississippi farm. And uh, it's like they, it's like one of their research professors is quoted in saying, the current research is riddled with bias or insufficiencies and often conflict with one another. And the amount that they're requesting is unavailable to them because the government refuses to acknowledge that they need more medicine. So, you know, it is what it is. And let's just hope that they take a serious look at this and actually allow them to, uh, to break that, well, to break that mold or however I've you want got to put a, it. I've got an interesting question. Um, since the federal gro government is growing this cannabis in Mississippi and they're distributing it at, throughout the United States to these different patients, are they breaking federal drug trafficking laws? Well, I would assume. Well, you know, Ooh, absolutely. Well, you know, I don't think anyone's ever uh, called them called them out on that and i don't really know who makes the deliveries you would have to ask one of those 10 surviving patients who's still receiving those tins every month full of joints uh who does make the delivery is it a ups is it a D, I, I don't know is it a united UP, is, pot service yeah just a blank uh, a blank box is it a private delivery maybe like some kind of federal employee comes do they have to go to a federal facility and pick it up every month and then transport it back to their home these are unanswered questions definitely because i know those people don't live in Mississippi, no, they're like no what? They're like I've, what? A uh, handful left? Five people? That's, left? that's very clever. We should start thinking. We should uh, do a little homework on that and and uh, come back with an update. And then I'll have a story week. next week about um, the federal government arguing court. Well, uh, why it should be a Schedule One drug still? So yeah, we'll get into that next we'll week. The music's week. playing in the background, telling me we only have thirty seconds left. About so, a minute uh, left. So don't forget, we have our week together. We can monthly patients meeting. This Saturday from 2 to 4 at the Coffee Bee and Team Leaf on Maryland Parkway. And then we have our job fair Sunday, January 25th from 1.30 to 5 at the Clark County Library Theater on Flamingo Road. You can find that information on our meetup page. We uh, also have a meeting, a patient's first meeting at Pahrump on January 24th. And it's uh, Raymond's and my birthday, uh, the 18th through the 21st. So... 
Uh, be safe out there and wish us happy birthday. See you next time. <laughs>